Okay, Luke. Mm -hmm. So we're still here at the uh, John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. We are indeed. Still working on this question of entropy. Uh, my personal entropy is definitely increasing, trying to understand the various concepts. Yeah. Clearly is a messy topic uh, in physics and it appears that most physicists don't even realize it. Yes, yes absolutely. But, That's a real theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we'll get back to that another day. If we understand it. If we, if we ever understand anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but today, uh, what we're going to turn to is a topic close to our hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, related to the book that we wrote together, A Fortunate Universe, uh, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, Perfect Christmas Present Kids. Mm -hmm. um, and we've both spoken on this topic of fine tuning, and it can often elicit some inter interesting reactions with people. Uh, and uh, you, you can get into arguments and people will throw arguments in your faces and basically try and point out that the entire fine-tuning endeavor is misguided, wrong, whatever, yeah. whatever. So one of my favorite parts of the book is the uh, last but one chapter where we present the usual reactions that we have and our response to yeah. those reactions. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of them that we're going to work our way through. We're going to start with reaction number one. Reaction number one. Well, we should tell them what fine tuning is first. Oh now, yes, this. Now we've done a video on this, and uh, we'll link to that uh, maybe up here now if I work out how to do that, or down there. Yeah. Uh, depends on my YouTube skills. Uh, very, very briefly. Look, well, there are these laws that we. The best information we have is these are the the sort of fundamental laws. Our best idea of the fundamental laws of nature as we know them. These are called the standard models. That's the standard model of cosmology, standard model of particle physics. And they are, so for example, there's, there's a part of that model which describes how electrons work and move around. And what we find is within that equation, that equation's not trying to uh, approximate anything else. That's sort of the best equation we have. And we have to put into that equation some numbers, mm -hmm. it, like the mass of the electron. So that... The, it, so so when, when you say put in those numbers... Ah, uh, yes. What, what we mean, so... With, with these equations, I can predict a whole heap of stuff about how electrons will behave and what their properties are, but there's no way of writing down, starting with those equations, and then I do some mathematical stuff, and then out comes a prediction for the mass of the electron. It doesn't come out of the equations. I have to tell the equation, it's, it's, it's just in there as a number, that the mass of the electron is whatever it is. So you have to measure it somehow, then yeah. you can use the equations. Yeah, we can definitely measure it. Um, you know, that's... A, that's fine. So we know what it is. It's just not anything that comes out of those equations. And so the interesting thing is, if we're trying to think about other ways the universe might have been, if we want to start playing that game, and we want to do that not just at the level of, you know, what if, what if the Battle of Britain had gone the other way or something like that, but let's get to the fundamental laws and change those. We might think about, let's change these numbers and see what happens. The weird thing that happens when we start doing that is that we can predict what these other universes would be like. Not our universe, but they're another way the universe could have been, as far as we know. And they all turn out to be places where it seems like life would be impossible. Because any kind of complexity would be impossible. Okay. The sort of things that life in general relies on. Matter is stable, but it can interact and it, it comes together you know, under gravity to make stars and all that sort of stuff. And the periodic table is an important one. Periodic table is quite yeah. important. But there's, there, are, there are some pretty easy ways to take those numbers in the, in the standard model, give them a twist this way, and the whole periodic table doesn't work anymore in that protons and neutrons just don't stick to each other. And just to clarify, when you say give it a twist, you're giving this idea that there's a big hand out there. Yeah, that hand is our hand. Yeah. We're, we're in control of this. Yeah. Uh, it, the f th we're talking about chapter seven of the book. Right in chapter one, we've got to get lay this down straight away. Uh, the, the phrase fine tuning is not one that we made up, and it's a metaphor, right? It's just it's just the idea of here's a, here's a sort of list of a uh, set of possibilities, and there's an interesting thing happening, but it's only in a very small range. Like like the radio dial. Here's a list of possible ways you could uh, set the dial and uh, only a small fraction of those do the, the, the channel that you're interested in. Okay. So that's the metaphor. Okay. So, so our uh, 
The idea we get across in the book, not only our idea, of course, this, this is built on lots of work, is that our universe, the conditions of the laws of physics in our universe appear to be fine-tuned yeah. that allow complexity and hence life to be here. Yeah. You tell an audience this and reaction one is... Well, the f well I, some people just say, well, it's a coincidence. So the question is, here's a fact, what do I do with it? You go, oh, and that's it. That's the whole reaction. That's all you need to say. So, you know, the, the universe had to be some way, it's this way, deal with it. Um, and so the reaction that we, we have, that we put forward in the book to this is, you know, as, as scientists and just more generally as people who think, uh, the fact that something is a coincidence, if I'm going to say this set of affairs are a coincidence, that has to come at the end of looking at a whole way, a whole bunch of ways in which they might be it might be explained and discarding those ways and being left with kind of the default of they d it doesn't need an explanation at the end of the day. Uh, and so, you know, there are some weird, there are some weird coincidences in history. Actually, one of my favorite ones is there was a book written um, and, and the, the story of the book sounds a bit familiar. There's this uh, huge liner, uh, ocean liner that was built uh, around the start of the, the 20th century in uh, the UK and it was going to go across the Atlantic to New York and it was on its maiden voyage. It was called Unsinkable uh, and about 400 miles off the coast it hits an iceberg and because, because there aren't enough uh, life jackets, on, uh, sorry, uh, lifeboats on board, uh, a whole lot of people die as it goes into the ocean. And the name of that ship is the Titan. That is the, that is the story of a book that was written 14 years or 16 years before the Titanic sunk, right? And so that's kind of amazing to pick, look it up. I think it's just called The Wreck of the Titan. And you look at that and you think, okay, that's weird. Is it just a coincidence? Well, think about what it would be to not be a coincidence. Maybe someone read the book and wanted to make that story happen and so used a tugboat to pull an iceberg at just the right... Like, any set of... Any, any theory that would make that not a coincidence just sounds ridiculous. And so at the end of the day, you just have to go, all right, well, that was weird. I suppose it's... It, I mean, boat hits iceberg and sinks. I guess that's not a... a ridiculous thing to wear, to make up and uh, you, know, you just have to go eh, at the end of the day. But sometimes, I mean, you have to sort of, you have to at least quickly in your head start to think through the conspiracy theories that would need to be true for, for, for the book to have made it the, the case that the Titanic sunk. So that, now you get another uh, set of coincidences. Like, look at the earth, look at a map of the earth. And lots of people have noticed this. You, you can play jigsaw puzzles at the start. Everything sort of fits together. And not that long ago, at the, at the start of the 20th century at least, if you were told, if you so, said, hey, look, the Earth's like a jigsaw puzzle, they would have said, yeah, interesting. Um, if you've already decided that that's uh, not a significant fact, you can then start to tell a story about, well, humans see patterns in all sorts of things and... You can explain why someone is wrong, but that doesn't mean they are wrong. And so uh, along comes uh, plate tectonics. But, I mean, um, it sounds like a ridiculous idea. How on earth could the continents slide around on the surface of the Earth? I mean, in your mind, that's what's happening, right? We can, I can just imagine uh, uh, you know, Australia going this way. To actually imagine that that happened, it required you know, a, a lot more imagination and then finally actually good scientific evidence. So in that case, you had what, uh, some sort of you know, interesting fact. And if you'd just written it off as a coincidence, um, you would have actually been wrong because what you needed to do was actually look in detail at the things that might explain it. So for fine tuning, um, Yes, it, it is definitely an open possibility, but it's, it's a possibility that we will put at the end, okay? We'll go through a whole lot of other possible explanations, and if none of those take your fancy, then what do you know? We were just here in this life-permitting universe, and that's all there is to say.